Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, Basic Course by Foreign Languages Press. Chapter 9. Marxism fuses its links with the working class. As we saw earlier, Marx and Engels were deeply involved in the revolutionary communist groups of the 1840s. They thus came to lead the Communist League, which was an international body uniting revolutionaries of various European countries. They also drafted its program, the Communist Manifesto, which acquired world historic significance. However, at that time, in 1848, the influence of Marxism had yet to reach the vast working class masses. The influence of the Communist League was limited and consisted mainly of exiled workers and intellectuals. In fact, at that time, Marxism was just one of the many trends of socialism. The 1848 revolution, which spread insurrection throughout the European continent, was the first major historical event where Marxism proved itself in practice. Marx and Engels were in Brussels when the revolution first broke out in France. The Belgian government, fearing the spread of the revolution, immediately expelled Marx from Brussels and forced him to leave for Paris, where Engels soon joined him. However, as the revolutionary wave spread to Germany, both decided to move there immediately in order to directly participate in the revolutionary events. There they tried to consolidate the work of the Communist League and the workers' associations. They published a daily newspaper, Neureichen Zintang, which served as an organ of the propagation of the revolutionary line. The newspaper took a line in support of radical bourgeois democracy as the completion of the bourgeois democratic revolution was then the main task in Germany. However, the paper simultaneously served as the organizer of the emerging revolutionary proletarian party in Germany. Marx and Engels even tried to form a mass workers' party by uniting the workers' associations of various provinces in Germany. The paper lasted for one year. With the collapse of the revolution in Germany and other parts of Europe, the paper was forced to close down and Marx was expelled by the Prussian king. He retreated to Paris but soon had to leave from there too because of persecution by the French authorities. Engels continued fighting in Germany as a soldier in the revolutionary armies until the very end. After military defeat, he escaped and towards the end of 1849 joined Marx, who had by then settled in London. England then continued to be their center until the end of their lives. The defeat of the 1848 revolution spread confusion among the revolutionaries and proletarian activists throughout Europe. Most of the earlier dominant trends of socialism could not provide any proper understanding regarding the reasons for the course of events during the revolution. It was in such an atmosphere that Marx took up the task of explaining the social forces behind the initial victory and later defeat of the revolution. Since France was the center and principal starting point of both the upsurge and decline of the revolution, Marx concentrated his analysis on French events. This he did through his brilliant works, The Class Struggles in France, 1848-1850, to 1850, and The 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. They were Marx's first attempts to explain current historical events by means of the materialist conception of history. He analyzed with complete clarity the class forces behind each one of the major turns and twists in the revolution. He thus provided the class basis for revolutionary proletarian tactics. By exposing the role of various classes at various stages, he showed who were the friends and enemies of the revolution and therefore the approach of the proletariat to each of them. In the following period, Marx continued his writings on all the major political events throughout the world. In all these writings, he presented a clear perspective from a proletarian viewpoint. This distinguished them from other varieties of socialism, which proved incapable of providing real answers to the continuously changing world situation. It has clearly established the superiority of Marxism over other brands of socialism as a practical tool for understanding and changing the world. Simultaneously, Marx and Engels worked energetically to unite the weak and fragmented organizations of the working class. The Communist League, which had its main center in Germany, faced severe repression from the Prussian police. Many of its members in Germany were put behind bars and the organization itself was finally dissolved in November of 1852. During the long period of reaction after the failure of the 1848 revolution, Marx and Engels tried continuously to reorganize and revive the working class movement. Besides writing and publishing their works extensively, they maintained constant contact with the working class organizations in various countries, particularly England, France, and Germany. Their constant attempt was to form an international organization of the working class and to set up separate parties of the proletariat in the industrially developed countries. The main work in this respect was done by Marx. 
He worked throughout this period under very difficult conditions. After having been driven out by the governments of various countries, even after Mark settled in London, he was under constant surveillance by the secret police, particularly of Prussia. Besides the political repression, Marx's economic situation was already very bad. Due to the poor and disorganized state of the revolutionary working class movement at the time, it was unable to support him as a full-timer. Thus, his only source of earnings was the small payment per article, which he got for writing for a large American newspaper, the New York Tribune. This was, of course, totally insufficient for Marx's large family. They thus faced constant poverty, debt, and even starvation. Many times, household items had to be pawned to provide food. Marx had six children, but only three survived beyond childhood. When his baby daughter died, the burial had to be delayed for a few days until some money was to be collected for the burial. Marx himself faced constant serious illnesses, which he had to struggle against to complete his work. Throughout all of these economic difficulties, the main support for the Marx family was Engels. After the failure of the 1848 revolution, Engels had been forced to take up a job in, the, in his father's Manchester firm. He worked there for 20 years, first as a clerk and then for the last five years as a partner in the firm until 1869. During this period, he had substantial income which, with which he would regularly help Marx. Engels' help, however, was not merely economic. Though he did not have much spare time because of his job, he put in all of his efforts to continue study and help Marx. They corresponded very regularly and, cons and constantly exchanged ideas. Marx always consulted Engels on major questions, particularly on decisions regarding the international working class movement. Their efforts finally bore fruit in 1864 with the formation of the International Working Men's Association, the first international. Marx soon became its leader and was primarily responsible for drawing up its first program and constitution. The International's program, however, did not contain the strong words of the Communist Manifesto. The First International, unlike the Communist League, was not an organization limited to small groups of revolutionaries. In fact, many of these sections of the International, especially those of England and France, represented organizations with a vast mass following of workers. However, most of these organizations did not have a clear and correct understanding. Though they were composed predominantly of workers, the level of consciousness was normally lower than that of the selected revolutionaries of the Communist League. The program and constitution thus had to be formulated to keep this in mind. The correct line had to be presented in a manner acceptable to the member of organizations of the international. Marx, with his great ideological depth and practical organizational experience, was at that time the only person capable of thus drafting these documents and was therefore given this task. In subsequent years, too, it was he who drafted all the most important documents of the First International. It was thus Marxism alone that could provide the ideological, political, and organizational perspective for the First International. Implementation of this perspective meant constant struggle against the various anarchist and opportunist trends that arose within the movement. Among other things, the anarchists oppose a strong organization, whereas the opportunists opposed resolute struggle. Fighting both deviations, Marx and Engels worked to build the international into a mass organization of struggle, uniting the workers in both Europe and the United States. In this, they largely succeeded, leading at the same time the formation of the independent proletarian parties in many of the industrialized countries of the world. By the time of the historic Paris Commune from 1871, Marxism had advanced very far from its position at the time of the 1848 revolution. Marxism no longer remained merely one of the trends of socialism. The earlier trends of utopian socialism had been swept away by history, and it was Marxism alone that retained full practical significance. Marxism also was no longer restricted to small groups, but had become a mass phenomenon. Its influence extended to proletarian movements in various industrialized countries. It provided the ideological leadership to independent proletarian parties. It headed a massive proletarian movement which had begun to challenge the bourgeoisie. Marxism has fused its links with the vast working class masses. Chapter 10, The Lessons of the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune was the first time in history where the proletariat seized power and attempted to set up its own rule. The Commune could not consolidate its rule and was crushed within a period of 72 days. However, its experience was of world historic significance. During its short existence, it had provided a glimpse of the new society. 
Through both of its positive examples, as well as its mistakes, it provided immensely valuable lessons for the working class of the world. Marx, in his role as leader of the First International, summarized the lessons of this great experience for the international proletariat. The context of the Paris Commune was framed by the Franco-German War of 1870-71. It started in July 1870 with the reactionary French Emperor Napoleon III ordering an attack on Prussia, which with other small provinces became Germany in January 1871 because he mistakenly thought that the Prussians were in a weak position. His armies were rapidly defeated and Napoleon III surrendered and was taken prisoner by the Prussians in September of 1870. Napoleon III's surrender was followed by the setting up of a republic headed by a politician named Thiers. In March 1871, Thiers signed a peace treaty with the Germans. Paris, however, which had been surrounded by the Prussian army since September 7, 1870, did not submit to Thiers. It was under the control of the Paris National Guard, which was composed of mainly workers. On March 18, 1871, Thiers sent his army to disarm the National Guard. There was a revolt in which two French army generals were shot dead and the army was forced to retreat. Power had passed over into the hands of the National Guard, who within a week held, held elections and set up a council consisting of 92 members. The council, which had a large number of workers, became the organ of government. It introduced numerous progressive measures for the reorganization of social life and the administration of the city, and thus had the full support of the whole working people. The Paris Commune was, however, a government under constant attack. Fearing the strength of the working class, the German and French oppressors immediately joined hands to crush the commune. Germany even directly helped the Thiers government by releasing a large section of the French army who had surrendered and been taken prisoner in 1870. The Thiers government, strengthened by reinforcements, then launched a full-scale campaign to conquer Paris. The workers fought bravely, but they were no match for the well-equipped professional army. After many days of heroic fighting, resulting in thousands of martyrs, the commune was crushed on May 28, 1871. Even after the takeover, over 30,000 communards were butchered in cold blood. Over 45,000 were court-martialed, of whom many were executed and others sent to prison or into exile. It was as if the bourgeoisie was determined to teach an unforgettable lesson to the workers, lest they ever even dreamed of seizing power again. The First International was at the peak of its popular appeal at the time of the Franco-Prussian War and the Paris Commune. It had a broad base among the workers and regularly provided guidance on political questions. When the Franco-Prussian War broke out, Marx immediately published a document in the name of the General Council of the First International. This document is one of the first applications of the Marxist tactical principles regarding war. He called for the international solidarity of the workers while putting the blame for the war on the rulers of both France and Prussia. Due to the propaganda of the international, a strong spirit of internationalism existed among German and French workers. In fact, Babel and Wilhelm Leibniz, two members of the parliament and leaders of the German proletarian party who were Marxist members of the international, were jailed by the Prussian government for voting in parliament against war credits. In the initial period of the war, Marx characterized it as a defensive war on the part of Germany because of the reactionary nature of the aggressive Napoleon III regime. He, however, predicted the fall of this reactionary ruler. When this took place, Marx immediately published a document that called on the German workers to oppose what had now become a German war of conquest. He called for peace with France and recognition of the newly formed republic. He characterized the republic as being led by the finance aristocracy and big bourgeoisie. However, he felt it would be premature to attempt to overthrow the republic and form a workers' government. In fact, Marx firmly opposed any attempt at insurrection in Paris. This was because the German enemy had already surrounded Paris and there was very little chance of any insurrection surviving under such circumstances. Despite Marx's advice, activists of various anarchist and conspiratorial trends who had some following in Paris made various attempts at organizing an uprising. When the insurrection actually took place, Marx, in spite of all of his earlier opposition, declared full and militant support for the commune. He immediately recognized its historic significance and sent hundreds of letters throughout the world trying to build up support. Through messengers, he kept in contact with the communards, sending advice to the internationalists in the commune. Consulting Ingalls, who was an expert in military matters, he also sent advice regarding the military defense of the commune. 
though the leadership of the commune was in the hands of the members of other groups and trends, the Marxists within the commune made all attempts to strengthen its activities and defense. After the defeat of the commune, the International was the principal organization, which arranged for shelter and help to gain jobs for the communards who had to flee the brutal repression of the French bourgeoisie. Marx, who immediately hailed the commune as an event of immense historic, historic significance, made an in-depth analysis trying to draw lessons from its experience. This work, The Civil War in France, was written during the commune but could only be published two days after its fall. It served to propagate its achievements and build the correct perspective towards the commune among revolutionaries and workers throughout the world. Firstly, Marx highlighted the major positive and revolutionary measures taken by the commune, which he pre presented as the incubation of the new society. He pointed out the major political decisions as the separation of church and state, abolition of subsidies to the church, replacement of standing army by a people's militia, election and control of all judges and magistrates, upper salary limit for all government officials, and making them strictly responsible to the electorate, etc. The major socio-economic measures were free and general education, abolition of night work and bakeries, cancellation of employer fines and workshops, closing of pawn shops, seizure of closed workshops which were run by workers' cooperatives, relief to the unemployed, and rationed houses and assistance to debtors. All of the above measures showed that although there was no clear direction to the commune, all of the decisions had the clear stamp of the actions of the proletariat. Despite being faced constantly by the desperate question of its survival, the commune through its actions provided the first glimpse of what type of society the coming proletarian revolution would bring. It provided the first experience of the proletariat and state power, what Marx and Engels referred to as the first dictatorship of the proletariat. The commune by its weakness also provided the valuable lessons for the future struggles of the proletariat. These were pointed out by Marx. A serious weakness of the commune was the lack of a clear and centralized leadership of a single proletarian party. From this, Marx concluded that for the success of the revolution, it was absolutely necessary to have a leadership of a strong, clear-sighted, and disciplined proletariat party. The other point, which Marx repeatedly stressed, was the need to smash the existing state machinery. In order to build the new worker state, it was not possible to rely upon the existing state machinery of the bourgeoisie with its state officials who were totally committed to preserving the old social order. In fact, in order to build the worker state, it was first necessary to smash the existing state apparatus and get rid of all of the high-level officials associated with it. In the period of reaction and repression following the commune, there was considerable confusion among the revolutionary forces as to how to assess the experiences and draw the correct conclusions. The anarchists, who had participated in large numbers in the commune, were particularly at a loss. Marx's analysis gave a clear-cut position, dispelling all types of confusion. Marx also helped propagate the correct understanding regarding the commune throughout the world. Following the Commune, the bourgeoisie portrayed Marx as the real leader of the Commune, and he was therefore even interviewed by the world press. Through these interviews, he was thus able to present the correct stand to various countries. Marxism again was providing the correct answers. Chapter 11. The Spread of Marxism and the Rise of Opportunism The period after the Paris Commune was one of the most reactionary offensive by the bourgeoisie on the working class movement. This had its impact on the first international. The French section was the worst hit, with most of the members becoming refugees in other countries, with severe factional fights among them. The German labor movement also faced setback with the long arrest of the main Marxist leaders, Babel and Leibnacht, who had opposed the war and the annexation of parts of France. This meant that two of the most important sections in the, inter in the international were handicapped. Simultaneously, there was a split in the English section with some of the leaders leaving the international in opposition to the militant stand in support of the commune taken by Marx. This coupled with the manipulations by the anarchists weakened the international. Marx and Engels decided to transfer the headquarters of the international from London to New York. This decision was taken in 1872 Congress of the International. The weakened international, however, could not revive and was finally dissolved in 1876. The dissolution of the First International, however, did not stop the onward march of Marxism and setting up of new proletarian parties. The period after the Paris Commune saw a long, almost 35-year gap of peace without any major wars between the big capitalist countries on the European continent. 
During this period, the labor movement in most industrialized countries expanded rapidly. Socialist parties, which had a basically proletarian composition, set up large and elaborate structures. Under their leadership grew trade unions, daily newspapers, workers' cooperatives, etc. Working often under legal conditions, they participated quite successfully in the bourgeois parliaments. It was many of these parties who got together to set up the Second International in 1889. This formation of the Second International gave further encouragement to the growth of the new proletarian socialist parties in various parts of the world. Until the end of their lives, Marx and Engels continued to play the role of the ideological leaders and practical organizers of this growing working class movement. They provided constant theoretical inputs to strengthen the foundations of the growing movement. Marx concentrated on further study of political economy and more in-depth study of capitalism. The first volume of Capital came out in 1867. After that, Marx continued to struggle against severe ill health to try to complete the latter volumes of this work. However, it remained unfinished right up to his death on March 14, 1883. Ingalls, however, completed the monumental task of collecting together Marx's notes, editing them, and finally publishing the second and third volumes of Capital. Ingalls, in fact, also did substantial theoretical work after becoming a full-timer in 1869. Along with Marx and Alone, he published various works on philosophy, socialist theory, evolution, origin of social and political institutions, etc. After the death of Marx, he played a central role in guiding and building the movement in various countries. Through regular correspondence, he performed the role of a center, which was otherwise non-existent throughout this period. This he did till his death on August the 5th, 1895. A large part of Marx and Engels' work was fighting the trends of opportunism that started gaining strength with the growth of the movement. One important trend was Lasallism, which arose first during the First International but continued also in later years. Its originator, Fernandad Lasalle, was the founder of the first working class socialist party set up in 1863 in Germany. The main opportunist aspects of Lasallism were discouraging worker struggles for higher wages and making appeals to the state for aid to set up workers' cooperatives, which Lasalle saw as a main means of reforming society and gradually bringing about socialism. In order to fight the wrong understandings on wage struggles, Marx wrote the work Wages, Prices, and Profits and presented it in the General Council of the First International in 1865. The fight against Lasallism continued in 1875, when Marx wrote the critique of the Gotha program. The Gotha program was the program drafted at the time of the unification of the Lasallist and Marxist proletarian parties of Germany into one party. At that time, the Marxists were so keen on unity that they made compromises with the opportunist politics of Lasallism. Marx in his critique made a thorough criticism of the points that had opportunist politics. However, the critique was only given to a handful of the leading Marxist members of the German party. It was not circulated, and very few of its suggestions were brought into practice. However, in 1891, when a new party program was being drafted, Ingalls insisted on publishing the critique despite the protests of some leading members of the parties. This time, the La Salist aspects did not appear in the new program. Other opportunist trends that appeared were similarly resolutely opposed by Marx and Engels as long as they were alive. After Engels' death, however, one of the biggest attacks on Marxism appeared from within the proletarian movement itself. Since direct opposition to Marxism was very difficult, this attack came in the form of an attempt to revise Marxism. This trend, which later came to be called revisionism, was initiated first by Bernstein, one of the leading members of the German party and also of the Second International. He first presented his views in 1898-99 to within the German party. Bernstein proposed that because of the changed conditions, it was necessary to change all the basic formulations made by Marx. He proposed that it was not necessary to have a violent revolution to bring about socialism, and that reform of capitalism institutions would gradually bring about socialism. As opportunism had been growing in the working class movement, Bernstein's revisionism soon found supporters in various parties. However, at the same time, many genuine revolutionaries rallied around in the support of Marxism. The debate was taken up before the Congress of the Second International held in 1904. The Congress strongly condemned revisionism by a vote of 25 to 5, with 12 abstentions. 
There was also another compromise resolution which did not so strongly condemn revisionism that did pass because of a tie vote of 21 to 21. Thus, in both the resolutions, there was a very big section that supported or did not want to take a strong stand against revisionism. Though the Congress finally condemned revisionism, it was quite clear in 1904 that opportunism and revisionism had built a substantial base for itself at the highest levels of the international working class movement. The opposition to opportunism in many countries, however, was also strong. A particularly strong center was in Russia, where the Bolsheviks under the leadership of Lenin had already waged numerous struggles against Russian varieties of opportunism. Chapter 12. Marxism in Russia. Early life of Lenin. Russia was one of the countries where Marxism and Marxist literature spread very early. In fact, the first translation of Marx's principal work, Capital, or Das Kapital, in German, was in Russian. An edition published in 1872, just five years after the original German edition, was an immediate success with good sales and numerous positive reviews in prestigious journals. Its impact was so great that by 1873 to 1874, quotes from Capital already started appearing in the propaganda of radical student agitations in big Russian cities. The translation into Russian of other Marxist works was also taken up quite early by Russian revolutionaries attracted to Marxism. One such revolutionary was Vera Zasulik, a woman revolutionary known for her attempt to assassinate the governor of St. Petersburg. She started a correspondence with Marx in 1881, which she later continued with Engels after Marx's death. In 1883, she became a part of the first Russian Marxist organization, the Emancipation of Labor Group, led by George Plekhanov. Plekhanov participated in the first Congress of the Second International in 1889, after which he met Engels for the first time. After this meeting, Plekhanov continued to maintain close links and take guidance from Engels. Plekhanov played a principal role in establishing Marxism in Russia. He translated and popularized many of Marx's and Engels' works. While combating the anarchist and peasant socialist views of the Nardiniks, he also made many theoretical contributions to Marxism. Russia at that time was under the tyrannical rule of the Tsar, against whom many revolutionaries and revolutionary groups had started activities. Many of these groups, however, had leanings towards anarchism and terrorism. Plekhanov and the Emancipation of Labor Group played a crucial role in converting considerable sections to Marxism. Lenin, who joined hands with this group at a later stage, was however the outstanding figure who advanced Marxism and the proletarian movement. Lenin was the party name of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, who was born on April 22, 1870, in the city of Simbursk, which was the capital of Simbursk province. It was situated on the Volga, which is Russia's biggest river. Though it was a provincial capital, communication with the outside world was limited during Lenin's youth. There was no railway, and the, mains of, and the main means of transport was via steamers that traveled up and down the Volga. This, however, stopped during the long winter months when the river froze into ice and journeys had to be made on, on horseback. Lenin's father was a well-educated man who, through hard work, had risen from the level of a poor peasant to become a teacher, inspector of schools, and finally the director of elementary schools in the Simbergs province. He was also given the noble rank of civil counselor in 1874. He died in 1886. Lenin's mother was a daughter of a rural doctor. Though she did not go to school, she was educated at home and learned many foreign languages, which she later taught her children. She died in 1916. They had eight children, of whom two died in early childhood and one in her teens. Lenin was the fourth child. All of his brothers and sisters grew up to be revolutionaries. Lenin was, however, the most influenced by his elder brother, Alexander. Alexander was a brilliant student and gold medalist of the University of St. Petersburg, then the capital of Russia. He was a member of secret revolutionary study circles of revolutionary youth in St. Petersburg and conducted political propaganda among the workers. He stood ideologically between the Narodniks and Marxism. In 1887, Alexander was arrested along with his elder sister Anna and other comrades for trying to assassinate the Tsar. Anna was later released and banned from St. Petersburg. Alexander, who was the leader of the group, was hanged on March 8, 1887, along with four of his comrades. Lenin, who was only 17 years old at the time, vowed to avenge his brother's martyrdom. From a very young age, Lenin was a model student with a very systematic method of study. 
Unlike other students, he never produced his assignments at the last minute. Rather, he prepared an early outline and draft, constantly making notes, additions, and changes before producing his final draft. He had a level of concentration and did not talk to anyone who disturbed him while studying. He was a great admirer of his elder brother and at a young age tried to imitate Alexander in everything he did. A month after his brother was hanged, Lenin, despite the severe tension and grief, had to sit for his school exit exams. He received a gold medal as the school's best student. Despite the gold medal, Lenin could not get admission into either the St. Petersburg University or Moscow University because he was the brother of a known revolutionary. He finally gained admission to the smaller University of Kazan. However, he was expelled within three months from the city of Kazan for participating in a demonstration against the new re regulations limiting the autonomy of universities and the freedom of students. The police officer who escorted him to the city limits tried to convince the young Lenin that he was up against a wall. Lenin, however, replied that the wall was a rotten one which would crumble with one kick. The next year, in 1888, Lenin was allowed to return to Kazan, but was not given readmission into university. It is then that he started attending one of the secret Marxist study circles. During this period and later, when the family moved to another province of Samara, Lenin spent a large amount of his time reading and studying. Besides reading the works of Russian revolutionaries, Lenin at the age of 18 started reading many of Marx and Plekhanov's works. He started propagating his knowledge of Marxism, first to his eldest sister Anna, and then by organizing small discussion groups of his friends. He also took to squim swimming, skating, mountain climbing, and hunting. In the meantime, his mother made repeated attempts to get him admitted into university. He was, however, again refused at Kazan. He also refused a foreign passport to go and study abroad. After many applications in 1890, Lenin was finally accepted only as an external law student at St. Petersburg University. He could sit directly for the examinations without being allowed to attend lectures. Lenin was determined to complete his course at the same time as his former Kazan fellow students. He therefore studied on his own and completed the four-year course within one year. In the examinations held in 1891, he received the highest marks in all subjects and was given a first-class degree. In January 1892, he was accepted as a lawyer and started practice in the Samara Regional Court. Lenin, however, was least interested in his law practice. While taking his exams in St. Petersburg, he developed Marxist contacts there and gotten a supply of Marxist literature. In Samara, Lenin spent a large part of his time giving lectures in illegal study circles of workers and others. He also formed the first Marxist study circle of Samara. Samara was a center of the Naraniks, and Lenin concentrated his energy on fighting the Naranik ideology of that time, which had moved to liberalism. At the same time, he had a great respect for the brave, selfless Narodnik revolutionaries of the 1870s, many of whom were, were residing in Samara after retiring from politics. Lenin was also eager to learn from them about their revolutionary work, their secrecy techniques, and about the behavior of revolutionaries during interrogation and trials. It was in Samara that Lenin started his first writings, which were circulated among the study circles. He also translated the Communist Manifesto into Russian. Lenin's activities and influence started spreading beyond Samara to other provinces of the Volga region. After developing well-formed views, Lenin now wanted to broaden the scope of his revolutionary work. With this aim, he moved in August 1893 to St. Petersburg, a major industrial center with a large proletariat. As a cover, he took up a job as an assistant lawyer to a senior barrister of St. Petersburg. He, however, did very little legal work and concentrated wholly on revolutionary activities. Lenin soon became a leading figure, bringing a new life to the numerous secret study circles of St. Petersburg. He also influenced the Moscow circles. Besides lecturing in circles, he always interested in learning every minute detail of the workers' lives. In circles, he convinced a big section of the revolutionaries to move from selective propaganda in small circles to mass agitation among the broad masses of workers. Propaganda in those days was understood similar to our political education classes today. It was during this period that he met his future wife, Kripskaya, who had already come into contact with Marxism and was teaching without payment at a night school for workers. 
Many of her worker students were part of a study circle conducted by Lenin. Lenin himself would always be eager to learn from her deep knowledge of the lives and working conditions of St. Petersburg's workers. When Lenin fell ill, she visited him and gradually their friendship grew into love. Meanwhile, Lenin continued to expand his contacts in many more Russian cities. In February 1895, a meeting of the groups in various main cities decided to send Lenin and another delegate from Moscow abroad to make contact with the Emancipation of Labor Group. Lenin's first visit to Europe lasted from April to September 1895. During this period, he met Plekhanov and Axelrod of the Emancipation Labor Group and other leaders of the German and French working class organizations. He wanted keenly to meet Ingalls, but could not do so as Ingalls was on his deathbed. Upon his return to Russia, he united all of the Marxist circles of St. Petersburg into one political organization called the League of Struggle for the Emancipation of the Working Class. The League immediately started agitation and organizing strikes in large factories of the cities. It also made plans to publish an illegal magazine of the workers. The magazine, however, could not be published. Through the help of an, of an informer, the secret police that had been keeping a close watch on Lenin finally managed to arrest him along with proof. He was picked up in December 1895 along with the manuscript of the first issue of the illegal magazine and was sent to jail. Even from jail, Lenin managed to keep a close contact with his comrades outside. His mother and sister Anna brought him numerous books and he sent letters in the books through a code that he had taught his sister. He also sent letters written in milk, which served as invisible ink that became visible later on being warmed up. He used black bread as his ink pot so that he could swallow them as soon as any prison guard came nearby. Thus from the jail, Lenin could even write pamphlets and direct strikes, which during 1896 were on an upswing throughout Russia. He came to be known as the real leader of the League. At the same time, he also started intense study and research on his first major theoretical work, on the development of capitalism in Russia. While studying heavily from morning to night, Lenin kept his fitness by daily exercise before going to bed. After over one year in jail, Lenin was released but immediately sentenced to three years as exile in Siberia, which he reached in May 1897. Krupsakia in the meantime had also been arrested. Lenin proposed marriage to her from Siberia. She replied simply, if I'm to be wife, so be it. She was allowed to join him in Siberia, which she reached in May 1898. Lenin spent most of his time in Siberia doing theoretical work. With Krupsakia's help, he translated an English book, Industrial Democracy, into Russian. He also completed his work on the development of capitalism in Russia, which he published legally in 1899. He also started his struggle against the economists, an opportunist trend linked to the Bernsteinian revisionism mentioned in the previous chapter. He also wrote extensively on what the program and immediate tasks of the Russian Revolution should be. When he came out of exile in early 1900, he immediately started work on those tasks. Chapter 13, Lenin and the Proletarian Party of a New Type. The most urgent and pressing task when Lenin came out of exile was to build the revolutionary proletarian party. The Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, RSDLP, had formally been established in a congress held in 1898 attended by nine delegates. However, the central committee elected at the congress was very soon arrested. Though the banner of the party had been announced, this congress did not actually succeed in unifying all the groups and building up a single party organizational structure. Thus, in 1900, this task remained. The plan for building up the party had been worked out in detail while in exile. Lenin felt the key to it was setting up an all-Russian political newspaper. Lenin proposed that the only way of politically and organizationally uniting the scattered Marxist study circles, groups, and organizations was through a political newspaper. This newspaper would be able to link politically all the varied cells throughout Russia by presenting the correct line and immediately fighting all opportunist deviations. At the same, the most difficult task of secretly distributing an illegal paper would by itself create an underground organization trained in facing the repressive Russian secret police. Lenin wanted to first bring this plan into action before calling a party congress, because it was also first necessary to defeat the opportunist and revisionist trends that had raised their heads in the movement in the preceding years. 
Lenin's plan was first discussed with and approved by the League of Struggle in various Russian cities and at a conference of social democrats, which he arranged to discuss the plan. His principal associates in this plan were Martov and Patrizov members of the Central Group in St. Petersburg, who had been arrested and sent to Siberia at the same time as him. The plan was to publish the paper from abroad as it was too dangerous to publish it within Russia. Lenin also planned for this purpose to unite with Plekhanov's Emancipation of Labor Group, which already existed abroad. The editorial board was to consist of six members, three from the Emancipation Group abroad and three from Russia, Lenin, Martov, and Patrizov. After making all of the arrangements, the first issue of the paper came out in December 1900. It was called Iskra, meaning spark. Its title page carried the words of the first Russian bourgeois revolutionaries in 1825. The spark will kindle a flame. Iskra was printed in various countries at various times, Germany, England, and Switzerland. It was never sent directly to Russia, but went by extremely roundabout routes until they reached secret Iskra committees within Russia. The distributors had extremely difficult tasks, avoiding the secret police, and if Iskra smugglers were caught, they were straightaway exiled to Siberia. Iskra was a major tool for educating the working class, with lectures and study circles often consisting of reading articles from the paper. Iskra agents used every opportunity to distribute the newspaper as well as secret Iskra leaflets. They were distributed not only in the factories but also on the streets, in theaters, in army barracks, and through the post. In large cities, they were widely scattered through the streets or from balconies and theaters. In worker localities, they were distributed late at night or early morning by keeping them in factory courtyards and near water pumps where they would be seen in the morning. After each such operation, which was called sewing, a particular marking would be made by a nearby wall so that a full report could be gotten in the morning as to the impact of the night's work. In small towns and villages, the Iskra pamphlets were brought in peasant carts on market days and pasted on walls. All this was dangerous work as discovery meant immediate arrest and the possibility of banishment to Siberia. The comrades involved in this work slowly started building up into a team of professional revolutionaries on the basis of whom Lenin planned to build the proletarian party. As to the structure and composition of the party itself, Lenin believed it should consist of two parts, a close circle of regular cadres of leading party workers, chiefly professional revolutionaries that is, party workers free from all occupation except party work and possessing necessary minimum of theoretical knowledge political experience, organizational practice, and the art of facing and fighting the Tsarist police, and b. a broad network of local party organizations and a large number of party members enjoying in the sympathy and support of hundreds of thousands of working people. As the process of building a such party proceeded through the help of Iskra, Lenin gave direction to this process through his articles and books. Of particular significance were where to begin, what is to be done, and a letter to a comrade on organizational questions. In these works, he laid down the ideological and organizational basis of the proletarian party. Besides the organizational questions, a major battle waged by Lenin was the fight against the economists who wanted to restrict the social democratic party merely to the economic struggles of workers. They had grown in strength in Russia during Lenin's period in exile, and Lenin realized that economism had to be ideologically defeated before the convening of the party congress. He launched a direct attack on them, particularly through his book, What is to be Done? Lenin exposed how the economists' views meant bowing to the spontaneity of the working class movement and neglecting the role of consciousness and the leading role of the party. He showed how this would lead to slavery of the working class to capitalism. While mouthing Marxism, the economists wanted to convert the revolutionary party into a party of social reform. Lenin thus showed how the economists were actually Russian representatives of the opportunist trend of Bernsteinian revisionism. Lenin's book, which was widely distributed in Russia, succeeded in decisively defeating economism. It thus laid down the principles which later became the ideological foundation of the Bolshevik party.
The actual birth of the Bolshevik trend within the RSDLP took place at the Second Party Congress, which took place in July through August of 1903. The main debate at the Congress was regarding what should be the nature of the party, and thus who should be given membership to the party. Lenin, who had in might a tight, effective, professional, revolutionary-based party, proposed that all party members should work in one of the party organizations. Martov, on the other hand, had as his model the loosely functioning legal parties which had become common in the Second International at that time. Thus, he proposed loose criteria for membership, which would allow anyone who accepted the party program and supported the party financially to be eligible for party membership. He was thus ready to give party membership to any party sympathizer. In the vote on this point, the majority was with Martov. However, later when some opportunist sections walked out of the Congress, the majority came over to Lenin's side. This was reflected in the elections of the Central Committee and Editorial Board of Iskra, which went according to Lenin's proposals. The differences between the two groups, however, remained strong and continued even after the Congress. From that time, Lenin's followers, who received the majority of votes in the elections at the Congress, have been called the Bolsheviks, which means majority in the Russian language. Lenin's opponents, who received the minority of votes, have been called Mensheviks, which means minority in Russian language. Immediately after the Congress, the Mensheviks started manipulations and splitting activities. This created a lot of confusion. In order to clear the confusion, Lenin, in May 1904, published his famous book, One Step Forward, Two Steps Back. It gave a detailed analysis of the intra-party struggles, both during and, par and after the Congress, and on that basis explained the proletarian party's main organizational principles, which later came to form the organizational foundations of the Bolshevik party. The circulation of this book brought the majority of the local organizations of the party to the side of the Bolsheviks. However, the central bodies, the party organ, and the central committee went into the hands of the Mensheviks, who were determined to defeat the decisions of the Congress. The Bolsheviks were thus forced into form their own committee and started their own organ. Both groups also started making separate preparations for organizing their own Congress and conference. These were held in 1905. The split in the party was complete. The foundations, however, had been laid for the building of the true revolutionary party, the proletarian party of a new type. Chapter 14. The Russian Bourgeois Revolution of 1905. Development of Proletarian Tactics. The period of the split in the RSDLP came at the beginning of a period of major changes in the world situation. The long 35-year gap of peace in Europe between the main capitalist countries was broken with a series of wars. An important war among these was the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05. to These regional wars were only a war by which the imperialist powers were preparing themselves for a devastating World War I of 1914-18 to for the redivision of the world. The same period was also a period of new upsurge of revolutions. The main source of these revolutions was, however, now not Europe, but Asia. The first of these revolutions was the Russian bourgeois revolution of 1905, which followed by the Turkish, the Persian, and the Chinese bourgeois revolutions. The most important of these revolutions from the point of the role of the proletariat and the development of Marxist revolutionary tactics was the 1905 Russian Revolution. Its starting point was the Russo-Japanese War. The Russo-Japanese War, which started on the 8th of February 1904, ended in the defeat for the Tsar in a humiliating peace treaty on August 23rd of 1905. The Bolsheviks adopted a clear revolutionary standpoint to the war, opposed to their own government and opposed the false notions of nationalism or patriotism. Their perspectives was that the defeat of the Tsar would be useful and would weaken the Tsardom and strengthen the revolution. This is actually what happened. The economic crisis of 1900 to 1903 had already aggravated the hardship of the toiling masses. The war further intensified the suffering. As the war continued and the Russian armed forces faced defeat after defeat, the people's hatred for the Tsar increased. They reacted with the Great Revolution of 1905. The historic movement started with the big Bolshevik leg strike of the oil workers of Baku in December 1904. This was the signal for a wave of strikes and revolutionary actions throughout Russia. 
In particular, the revolutionary storm broke with the indiscriminate firing upon and massacre of a demonstration of unarmed workers on January 22, 1905 in St. Petersburg. The Tsar's attempt to crush the workers in blood only inspired a still fiercer response from the masses. The whole of 1905 was a period of rising wave of militant political strikes by workers, seizure of land and landlord's grain by peasants, and even a revolt by the Russian Navy sailors of the battleship Potemkin. Twice the Tsar, in a bid to divert the struggle, offered a first consultative and then a legislative Duma. Duma is the Russian parliament. The Bolsheviks rejected both Dumas, whereas the Mensheviks decided to participate. The high tide of the revolution was between October and December 1905. During this period, the proletariat, for the first time in world history, set up the Soviet of Workers' Deputies, which were assemblies of delegates from all mills and factories. These were the embryo of revolutionary power and became the model for the Soviet power set up after the Socialist Revolution in 1917. Starting with an all-Russia political strike in October, the revolutionary struggles went on rising until the Bolshevik-led armed uprisings in December in Moscow and other cities and nationalities throughout the country were brutally crushed, after which the tide of the revolution started to recede. The revolution was, however, not yet crushed, and the workers and revolutionary peasants retreated slowly, putting up a fight. Over a million workers took part in strikes in 1906 and 740,000 in 1907. The peasant movement embraced about half of the districts of the Tsarist Russia in the first half of 1906 and about one-fifth in the second half of the year. The crest of the revolution, however, had passed. On June 3, 1907, the Tsar effected a coup, dissolved the Duma he had created, and withdrew even the limited rights he had been forced to grant during the revolution. A period of intense repression under the Tsar Prime Minister, Stolyupin, called the Stolyupin Reaction, set in. It was to last until the next wave of strikes and political struggles in 1912. Though the 1905 revolution was defeated, it shook the very foundations of Tsarist rule. It also, in the short space of three years, gave the working class and peasantry a rich political education. It was also the period where the Bolsheviks proved in practice the basic correctness of their revolutionary understandings regarding the strategy and tactics of the proletariat. It was in the course of this revolution that the Bolshevik understanding regarding the friends and enemies of the revolution and the forms of struggle and the forms of organization were firmly established. The Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks had an opposite understanding of all of the above questions. The Menshevik understanding was the reformist and legalist understanding that had grown by then common in many parties of the Second International. It was based on the understanding that the Russian Revolution, being a bourgeois revolution, had to be led by the liberal bourgeoisie, and therefore the proletariat should not take any steps that would frighten the bourgeoisie and drive them into the arms of the Tsar. The Bolshevik understanding, on the other hand, was the revolutionary understanding that the proletariat could not rely on the bourgeoisie to lead the revolution and would have to itself take up the leadership of the revolution. It was on this revolutionary basis that the Bolsheviks developed their understanding of all the other important strategic and tactical questions of the revolution. Thus, the Bolsheviks called for the extension of the revolution and the overthrow of the Tsar through armed uprising. The Mensheviks tried to control the revolution within a peaceful framework and attempt to reform and improve Tsardom. The Bolsheviks pushed for the leadership of the working class, the isolation of the liberal bourgeoisie, and a firm alliance with the peasantry. The Mensheviks accepted an alliance with and the leadership of the liberal bourgeoisie and did not consider the peasantry as a revolutionary class with which it to be allied. The Bolsheviks were ready for participation in a, in a professional revolutionary government to be formed on the basis of a successful people's uprising, and called for the boycott of the Duma offered by the Tsar. The Mensheviks were ready to participate in the Duma and proposed to make it the center of the revolutionary forces of the country. The Menshevik understanding was not an isolated example of a reformist trend. In fact, the Menshevik understanding was fully representative of the understanding of the main leading parties of the Second International at that time. Their stand was basically supported by the leaders of the International. Thus, Lenin and the Bolsheviks were not only fighting the reformism of the Mensheviks, but also the reformist understanding that then dominated the so-called Marxist parties of the International. 
Lenin's formulations were, however, a continuation and development of the revolutionary understanding of Marx and Engels. It was a further development of the Marxist revolutionary tactics applied in the new conditions brought about by the growth of capitalism into a new stage, imperialism. Lenin published these tactics into his various writings during the course of the revolution and particularly in his book, Two Tactics of Social Democracy and the Democratic Revolution. This book, written in July 1905, after the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks held separated congresses, brought about the essential differences in the strategy and tactics proposed by the two groups. The fundamental tactical principles presented by Lenin in this and other works were, one, the main tactical principle running through all of Lenin's writings is that the proletariat can and must be the leader of the bourgeois democratic revolution. It in order to do this, two conditions were necessary. Firstly, it was necessary for the proletariat to have an ally who was interested in the decisive victory over the Tsardom, who might be disposed to accept the leadership of the proletariat. Lenin considered the peasantry to be such an ally. Secondly, it was necessary that the class that was fighting the proletariat for the leadership of the revolution and striving to become its sole leader would be forced out of the arena of leadership and isolated. Lenin considered the liberal bourgeoisie to be such a class. Thus, the essence of Lenin's main tactical principle of leadership of the proletariat meant the policy of alliance with the peasantry and at the same time the policy of isolation of the liberal bourgeoisie. 2. In regards to the forms of struggle and forms of organization, Lenin considered that the most effective means of overthrowing Tsardom and achieving a democratic republic was a victorious armed uprising of the people. In order to bring about this, Lenin called for mass political strikes and the arming of the workers. He also called for achieving the eight-hour workday and other immediate demands of the working class in a revolutionary way by disregarding the authorities and the law. Similarly, he called for the formation of revolutionary peasant committees to bring about changes like seizure of land in a revolutionary way. These tactics of disregarding the authorities paralyzed the Tsar's state machinery and released the initiative of the masses. It led to the formation of revolutionary strike committees in the towns and revolutionary peasant committees in the countryside, which later developed into the Soviets of Workers' Deputies and the Soviet of Peasants' Deputies. Lenin further held that the revolution should not stop after the victory of the bourgeois revolution and in the achievement of a democratic republic. He proposed that it was the duty of the revolutionary party to do everything possible to make the bourgeois democratic revolution continue into the socialist revolution. He thus gave concrete form to Marx's concept of uninterrupted revolution. These tactical principles became the basis for the Bolshevik practice during the following period. It finally led to the victory of the proletariat in the 1917 October Revolution and the establishment of the first workers' state. Chapter 15, World War I, Opportunism versus Revolutionary Tactics. The dawn of imperialism from the turn of the century brought with it the wars by the imperialist powers for the capture of colonies. An example was the Russo-Japanese War mentioned in the previous chapter. The war took place because both Russia and Japan wanted control over Manchuria and northern China and Korea. Similar wars for capturing or recapturing colonies started breaking out in various parts of the world. Thus, it became of crucial importance for the international proletarian movement to adopt the correct revolutionary position on the questions of colonialism and war. This, therefore, came up before the Congresses of the Second International. However, Opportunism by then had spread quite extensively within the parties of the Second International. Many leading sections of the parties in imperialist countries had in fact started taking the standpoint of bourgeoisie on many of the crucial political questions. This was seen very clearly at the 1907 Congress of the Second International, where the questions of colonialism and war were first taken up. On the question of colonialism, the leading body of the Congress, the Congress Commission, adopted a resolution on colonial policy and placed it before the general body for approval. This resolution, while criticizing the bourgeoisie's colonial policy and name, it did not reject totally the principle of capturing colonies. It in fact argued that under a socialist regime, it could be in the interests of civilization to capture colonies. 
such an openly imperialist position of these so-called Marxists was strongly opposed by the revolutionaries in the general body, and the resolution was finally defeated, but only by a small margin of 127 votes to 108. Similar opportunism of the leadership was seen in the case of the stand of question of war. Bebel, a known leader and a close follower and associate of Marx and Engels, prepared the resolution. The resolution, however, was left vague without any specific direction or course of action to be taken by the members in the event of war. This again was opposed strongly by the revolutionaries, particularly Rosa Luxemburg of Germany and Lenin. They then proposed an amendment which gave a clear-cut direction to the members of the international to fight to prevent war, to fight to end the war quickly in case it started, and to make full use of the economic and political crisis in the case of war to arouse the people and bring about revolution. This was a continuation of the revolutionary proletarian position on war that Marx had already clearly laid down. Since the opportunists could not openly oppose this understanding, the resolution was passed by the Congress. As the war danger grew greater, the 1910 and 1912 Congresses of the International again discussed and adopted resolutions regarding war. They decided that all socialists in Parliament should vote against war credits. They also repeated in their resolutions the wording of the amendment proposed in 1907 by Luxembourg and Lenin. However, the hold of opportunism over the Second International was so great that most of the leaders who passed these resolutions had absolutely no intention of standing by these decisions. This was seen when World War I actually broke out in July and August 1914. The German Social Democratic Party, which was the undoubted leader of the Second International, led the way. The trade union bureaucrats, instead of trying to rouse the workers against the war and for revolution, immediately entered into a no-strike agreement with the employers. In the party caucus fraction meeting that was held before parliamentary vote on war credits, a large majority voted in support of the war. Only a handful of revolutionaries, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, opposed. Kautsky, who was at the time the main ideological leader of the Second International, voted to abstain. Thus, on August 4, 1914, the German Social Democratic Party threw aside all the previous Congress resolutions and voted unanimously in Parliament to support the imperialist war. For the revolutionary proletariat, the Second International ceased to exist from that date. The German party immediately followed by the majority of socialists in France, Britain, Belgium, and other countries. The Second International broke into separate social chauvinist periods warring against each other. The Bolsheviks were almost the only party to stand by the anti-war resolutions. In the context of the Second International leaders falling totally into opportunism, it was left to Lenin and the Bolsheviks to uphold and implement the correct Marxist position regarding world war. Lenin immediately published writings presenting this correct understanding. The Central Committee of the RSDLP gave a call to turn the imperialist war into civil war and to build a new third international in place of the second international. Lenin started the process of building the third international by uniting all the leftist anti-war forces. Though these forces started holding conferences from 1915 onwards, much confusion continued. Lenin had to take up the task of clearing this confusion and establish among these elements the correct revolutionary position on the principles of socialism in relation to war, as well as the tasks of the revolutionary social democrats at the international level and in Russia. Lenin did this through various writings propagated both within Russia and internationally. The principles and tasks Lenin outlined can be presented in the following manner. Firstly, Socialists are not pacifists who are opponents of all war. Socialists aim at establishing socialism and communism, which by eliminating all exploitation will eliminate the very possibility of war. However, in the fight to achieve the socialist system, there will always be the possibility of wars, which are necessary and are revolutionary significance. Secondly, while deciding the attitude to be adopted towards a particular war, the main issue for socialists is this. What is the war being waged for, and what classes staged it and directed it? Thus, Lenin pointed out that during the period of the bourgeois democratic revolution, Marx had supported the wars waged by the bourgeoisie, 
which were against feudalism and reactionary kings. Because these wars were aimed at abolishing feudalism and establishing or strengthening capitalism, they were progressive or just wars. Adopting similar criteria, Lenin points out that in the era of imperialism and proletarian revolution, socialists will support all such wars that advance the world socialist revolution. According to such an understanding, Lenin gave examples of the types of war that may be called just or progressive wars. One, national wars waged by colonial or semi-colonial country against its imperialist exploiter. Two, civil wars waged by the proletariat and other oppressed classes against their feudal or capitalist ruling classes. Three, socialist wars for the defense of the socialist fatherland. Thirdly, Lenin pointed out that on the basis of the above understanding, there was nothing just or progressive about World War I. He compared the imperialist war to a war between a slaveholder who owns 100 slaves and a slaveholder who owns 200 slaves for a more just redistribution of the slaves. The essential purpose of World War I was for redistribution of the colonial slaves. Thus, there could not be anything progressive or defensive or just about the war. It was an unjust reactionary war. The only stand towards it could be the call to convert the imperialist war into civil war. The only use of such a war was to take advantage of it to make revolution. In order to do this, Lenin pointed out it was advantageous that one's own country is defeated in the war. Defeat would weaken the ruling class and facilitate the victory of revolution. Thus, any socialist revolutionary must work for the defeat of his own government in the war. Finally, Lenin pointed out that it was the duty of socialists to participate in the movement for peace. Nevertheless, while participating in the movement for peace, it is their duty to point out that no real and lasting peace is possible without a revolutionary movement. In fact, whoever wants a just and democratic peace must stand for civil war against the governments and the bourgeoisie. Though these principles and tactics were propagated among the parties of the, of the Second International, the only ones to implement them in practice were the Bolsheviks. It was this approach to the war that helped them to make use of the revolutionary crisis situation created by the war and within three years achieved the victory of Great October Socialist Revolution of 1917. Chapter 16, Lenin's Analysis of Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Marx's analysis of the laws of motion of capitalism belongs to the stage of free competitive capitalism where a large number of capitalist producers compete in the market. He analyzed to some extent the process of the centralization of capitalism. However, he did not live long enough to see the start of a new stage of capitalism, the stage of imperialism. This happened at the start of the 20th century and it was left to Lenin to analyze this process. In 1897-98, to 98, Lenin made some initial analysis of the development of capitalist world markets but did not analyze the subject of imperialism in full. However, with the start of World War I, a war caused by imperialism, it was necessary to do a full analysis of imperialism to understand the economic basis of the war and the political consequences for the proletariat. This question became all the more urgent in 1915 when the opportunist and revisionist leader of the Second International, Karl Kautsky, wrote a book on imperialism where he argued that the world economic system was moving towards an ultra-imperialism where there would be stability and no risk of war. His argument was similar to some people who analyze globalization today and argue that because of the growth of multinational groups and corporations and the spread of their capital to all countries, these multinationals will be opposed to war and there is therefore no danger of a world war. This theory presented during World War I gave a false picture of imperialism. Since such a false theory was presented by Kautsky, who was recognized at the time as the main theoretician of Marxism, it was absolutely necessary to oppose this theory and present the correct understanding. It was necessary to clear the confusion created by the second internationalists and give the correct analysts and present the correct tactics before the international working class movement. In order to do this, Lenin in 1916 did extensive research and produced his famous work, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. 
Besides this main work, he also wrote many other articles linking this basic economic analysis to the tactics of the proletariat. In the first place, Lenin tried to clear the confusion created by Kautsky and other opportunists what imperialism is. In order to answer this, he pointed out that imperialism is a specific historical stage of capitalism. Imperialism's specific character is threefold. One, monopoly capitalism. Two, parasitic or decaying capitalism. Three, moribund capitalism or capitalism on its deathbed. The replacement of free competition by monopoly is the fundamental economic feature, the essence of imperialism. Monopoly capitalism manifests itself in five principal forms. One, cartels, syndicates, and trusts. The concentration of production has reached a degree which gives rise to these monopolistic associates of capitalists who join together to crush other competitors. They fix prices, allot production among themselves, and make other arrangements and agreements to prevent others from entering and succeeding in the market. They play a decisive role in economic life. 2. The monopolistic position of the big banks and the creation of finance capital through the merger of monopoly industrial capital and bank capital. During Lenin's time, this had already reached the level where three, four, or five giant banks manipulated the whole economic life in the main industrialized countries. 3. The export of capital which gains particular importance. This feature, which is different from the export of commodities under a non-monopoly capitalism, is closely linked to the economic and political partition of the world. 4. The economic partition of the world by international cartels. At Lenin's time, there were already over 100 such international cartels, which commanded the entire world market and divided it among themselves in a friendly manner. Of course, this friendliness was only to be temporary and would last until war took place for a redivision of markets. 5. The territorial, political partition of the world, colonies among the biggest capitalist powers. This process of colonization of all of the backwards countries of the world was basically completed at the time of the dawn of imperialism. Any further colonies could only be taken through redivision of the world through war. On the basis of the above features, Lenin defines imperialism in the following way. Imperialism is capitalism in the stage of development in which the dominance of monopolies and finance capital has established itself, in which the export of capital has acquired pronounced importance, in which the division of the world among the international trusts has begun, in which the division of all territories of the globe among the biggest capitalist powers has been completed. The fact that imperialism is parasitic or decaying capitalism is manifested, first of all, in the tendency to decay, which is characteristic of every monopoly under the system of private ownership of the means of production. As compared to the rapid expansion under free competition, there is a tendency for, for production as well as a whole to decline under a monopoly. Technological progress is discouraged and new inventions and patents are deliberately suppressed. Secondly, the decay of capitalism is manifested in the creation of a huge stratum of rentiers, capitalists who live without working but merely on the basis of the interest or the, or the dividend they earn on their investments. Thirdly, export of capital is parasitism raised to a high pitch as it means the ex open exploitation of the cheap labor of the backwards countries. Fourthly, finance capital strives for domination, not freedom. Political reaction all along the line is a characteristic feature of imperialism. Corruption, bribery on a huge scale, and all kinds of fraud become common. Fifthly, the exploitation of oppressed nations and especially the exploitations of colonies by a handful of great powers increasingly transforms the imperialist world into a parasite on the bodies of hundreds of millions in the backwards nations. It reaches the stage where a privileged upper stratum of the proletariat in the imperialist countries also lives partly at the expense of hundreds of millions in the colonies. Imperialism is moribund capitalism, because it is capitalism in transition to socialism. Monopoly, which grows out of capitalism, is already dying capitalism and the beginning of the transition to socialism. The tremendous socialization of labor by imperialism produces the same result. 
the basic contradiction of capitalism between the social character of production and the private character of ownership only gets further intensified under imperialism. Thus, Lenin says, imperialism is the eve of the social revolution of the proletariat.